My name is Peter Demento, Peter Robert Demento. And did you did you uh, know where the Robert came from? Yes, I have. Uh, my mother's uncle, my mother's brother, um, was a young man that uh, died in a murder in Boston, in the Charles River, back in the 1930s. Oh. So it was a bad thing in the family, and I was my middle name, and a couple of my brother's middle names is also are also Robert. Yeah. That was primarily your mom's idea? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, what's your current family situation right now? I'm married to Noreen. My um, 50th anniversary will be May 26th this year. Um, we have four great sons, uh, Patrick, Michael, John, and Dan. And the unique thing about them is they all happen to go to the U.S. Air Force Academy out in Colorado Springs. They all graduated, they all played lacrosse, and three of the four are flying, and the fourth one is a very successful uh, contractor out in California. What a great story that is, Peter. Um, are they in the military, or are they in private? Oh, they would definitely. They all served in the military. They all, they all flew. Uh, three of the four flew, and um, they flew in Desert Storm, uh, all participated, Patrick in a B-52, Mike in a 141, and John with a monstrous cargo plane, a C-5. So they all had experiences and they all had um, trials and tribulations while yeah. doing it. Yeah. Part of the responsibility when you graduate from the Air Force Academy is to put in a minimum of five years, but if you go to flight school, you pay back that year of flight school and then you pay back uh, four more years. So they all served about between nine and 11 years. Have they transitioned now to the private sector? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Each each of the boys have, have out of the service now. Um, Patrick, the oldest, is the assistant chief pilot for FedEx. Um, Michael, the second oldest, flew for nine years for United and then decided to make the switch to FedEx also. Um, and John, the third guy, came out of the service, um, and he also flies for uh, FedEx. Mike is, in a, is an instructor pilot, and John is also an instructor pilot and does a lot of the training of new, new people coming in. And the fourth guy, Dan, of course, has um, left the service after nine years and living out in California. Do you see them very often? We try as much as possible. Yeah. Um, it's nice now with three of the boys down in Memphis because they're all together and two of them live within two miles and the other lives nearby. So when we go down there, we're able to see three of my sons and their wives and we're able to see 12 of the 14 grandchildren. Wow. So, and then we get out to California, which is a great place to visit. Uh, and see him, Danny and his wife, CJ, and two of my grandchildren. Peter, do you see any family traits that you know about showing up either in your sons or in the grandchildren? Do you see talents or proclivities uh, that come down through the family in, in, that genera in those generations? I would say if I had to trace anything, it's um, assertiveness, um, stick to it of this. Uh, the, my father and mother, you know, raised nine kids and we uh, had lots of problems in those years. Uh, and there was something about being independent and going out and doing it on your own. And I expect, I think I expect the same of my sons. And I think, I hope, and I, I seem to see it. My sons are passing that on to their children. Now, you may have answered this question by your previous response, but I was going to ask you about the differences or the individuality of each of your sons. Are there certain marked differences? Without question. Um, the number one son is a, um, has the ability to get along with people and is, and is very self-driven and very independent. Um, a good student. Um, the second son is an excellent student, was a physics major in high school and through the Air Force Academy, which was rather unique. While the third and fourth sons uh, 
were really very, very loyal to their friends and were, have always been very, very successful. And I'd say my first and, and uh, third sons are more alike, and the second and the fourth sons are more alike. Interesting. Okay. Uh, those listening who never perhaps met you or knew you will immediately be able to tell what part of the country you have yeah. originated from. Uh, why don't you talk about uh, where you were born and uh, the date of your birth and where you were born. Yes, I was born uh, August 3rd, 1936. It's also the day that Columbus set sail for America um, a few centuries before. Uh, but I was born in Boston, in the city of Boston at St. Elizabeth Hospital. But um, my hometown is Winthrop, Mass. Winthrop is a small town, forms the arm of land that protects Boston Harbor to the north. There are, um, it's only 20,000 people in the community and everyone seems to know everyone else or know the family members. Mm. So it was a nice, nice place to grow up. Uh, how old were you when you left? Uh, I, when I graduated from college uh, from Salem State Teachers College uh, back in 19, 1958, I was 22 years old, coming down to New York. Uh, I came down to visit a friend, Dick Dusalt, who was a business teacher at Brentwood High School. And he came down the year before looking for a job and interviewed in Brentwood and Huntington and uh, Brentwood offered him a job first, so he came down. And the following March, um, four other of my friends got in a car and decided to come down to St. Patrick's Day in New York City. And little did we know, but we were going to take a ride out to Brentwood on Long Island, which we thought was right outside the city. And we rode out on Southern State Parkway, which took us quite a while. But um, we had a great, great adventure. Um, three of the five of us uh, were uh, took jobs. Now that would have been 53 years ago? That was, no, 1958. 58, okay. And we had um, part of the experience of coming out when we get out here to see Dick at the high school. Um, we met a fellow by the name of Fred Weaver, who was the, um, the principal at the time, and he was enthusiastic and called the superintendent right away and said, listen, five young men have just shown up. Um, so he came right over and um, talked to us and wanted to interview us. and. We, to fill out applications, which we did, but we did it in sort of a, a joking fashion that we weren't really serious at the time about coming to New York. I was considering going to California to teach out in Long Beach. But um, anyways, we took a tour of the district and went down to Southeast Elementary and there was a village. There were only a few schools in the district at the time. Um, Southeast, Southwest, uh, Northeast and Village were the only elementary, and there was no middle school. The high school had opened the year before with 13 kids graduating in the class in 50, 57. So, um, it, it, Brentwood was new, but Gene Hoyt came over to see us and offered us this, and then when we got home the following Monday, all five of us had received telegrams Western Union in those days, yes. telegrams offering us positions in Brentwood. And three of us took them. Johnny Galaris, Mo Beaulieu, and myself. Okay. Best decision we could have made. Wonderful story. Wonderful. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, before we get away from the subject of, of uh, your origins, what's the earliest memory you have? Um, probably, uh, I guess I was pretty sick as a, as a child. I had pneumonia and, uh, it was one of those family stories that it was my grandmother, Mother Mython, who nursed me back by giving me, uh, milk and brandy and a little bread and kept me going. Uh, and it was also Mother Mython that bought me a little airplane, uh, so I could build up my strength again. Uh, and I do remember that, and I remember, and I was about four years old, four and a half years old. Mm. Of course, I remember going to school my first days. I can remember Shilly Street Elementary School, sitting in Miss Wing's first grade classroom. I can remember going to the reading groups, 
sitting up in those little nice little chairs up in a in a circle in the front of the room. Um, I, can, I can remember all my teachers in the elementary school: Miss Bean in the second grade, Miss Miss Ward in the third, Miss Leach in the fourth, Mrs. Kramer in the fifth, and Miss O'Donnell in the sixth. Every one of them um, made a, an impression on me, and it was definitely very very positive. And Mr. Chase, by the way, was the principal and. He had a steel finger. At least we thought he did because he, if someone was in a line, he always gave us that thump with the finger on the head to put us back in line, but he didn't. He was another wonderful man. Let me ask you about uh, your mom a little bit. What was her maiden name? Marion Mython. And uh, her relatives going back on the that side of the family were Sullivan and Cassidy. And so, and, the family goes back to the 18, 1830s where my mother's great grandmother came over from Ireland as a one of the few at the time was educated and she worked as a governess as a governess. That would have been even before the famine. Before the famine, be, right. Yeah. Yeah. And afterwards more came over, but they came from Cork. Okay. They sailed out of Cork and yes. they were from Waterford and just to the north. And my wife's family, the same way, was uh, from up around Shannon. Um, and they had dairy farms, and they still have the dairy farms. And we've visited four of the dairy farms in that Shannon area now. Okay, yeah. But and my, your father, you were going to say now. Yeah, my, my father's family also came, came over from, it, from Italy. And um, in the 1890s, um, he was again... Uh, an educated man, lived in the north end of Boston, right opposite the uh, the old North Church, 349 Hanover Street. And um, my father was born in the year 1905, as my mother was also. Okay, all right. And uh, where did you say your father was from in Italy? A, a town, a small town in Sicily oh. called Sparta Forta. Okay. And it's on the north coast just to the west of Messina. And there were still relatives there. There were many relatives by the name of Demento. And I'm in the middle right now of debating whether I'm going to go over and visit some of the family. Um, I met a fellow down in Viaggio Demento. I met him down in Sydney, Australia. When my third son got, got married, he stepped forward and he owns a bakery. Um, that wanted to check the name and the eyes of my son looked like his son. So anyway, my son's picture was in the paper and he wanted to know more about me. So he called me and had his son call me. And since then, we've visited twice and we've become great friends. But this goes from Sparta Forda in Sicily now to Australia and back to Iceland, New York. Wow. Wow. Great story. Give me a memory uh, from your childhood that uh, that pops up when I ask you for a memory. Perhaps it was a memory that involved your mom. A family memory or a community memory? Uh, Either one. Um, a family memory, I have to say about my mother. My mother, again, was a graduate of Salem State Teachers College in 1925. Now, I graduated in 1958, but my mother was very well educated um, and she was a self learner the rest of her life. Uh, so just about every book, novel or anything else that any one of the nine children brought in the house, we had an area to put it when we came in the house. My mother also had a, a reason to pick up those books. And so whatever we read, she read. And she never quizzed us on it, but we all knew that if we had any questions um, about uh, any book that we were reading at the time, that my mom would be able to talk to us about it. So it was a pretty unique experience, and she did that all the time. What was your dad's occupational background? My, my father was one of those fellas that uh, was born... Um, in 05, and when the time came in the, in the 1920s to go to college, times were getting tough, and um, he went off to school. There was rumors that he 
was planning to go to Harvard and all that sort of thing, but I'm not quite sure if he did. Uh, but he, so he, he worked as a number of odd jobs at the time um, and did a number of things. Uh, but his job that he really seemed to love was he was working for GE during the Second World War as a, um, as a foreman. And he loved that, but in 1945, when my grandmother was passing away of diabetes, she asked him to please go into the business with my grandfather, who had a glass business. It was the only private glass business in Boston to survive the Depression, and because they had a lot of insurance contracts. And my grandmother was involved with that business, and when she was dying, she wanted my father to go in also. Um, and he did. And it wasn't the best thing for him because he loved um, he was working with steam turbines and that sort of thing for GE. Um, and he went in and spent the rest of his working career until he was 70 uh, working in the glass business in Boston. And what happened to the business? Well, there was a number of relocations because of um, developments. Um, they Haymarket Square area, uh, Boston Scully Square area was all redeveloped by the Boston Redevelopment Authority and the business was taken and had to move and they paid them to move and move down down by Boston Garden and then the next thing you know that shop got closed also because of uh, redevelopment again. Yes. So when the time came and the third time came that there were really pressure on him to move again, he just at 70 years old of age did not want to move. So it's not so much that he retired, uh, but he stopped working. Yes. Now you, by what you've said before, it, it's clear that you came from a big family, uh, from a history of big families, it would appear. Yes. And uh, how, many, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I, I have eight brothers and sisters. There were seven boys and two girls in the family. Uh, all survived, all um, had good relationships growing up and everything else. We grew up as a family. Uh, my father and mother bought a house on Cottage Ave in Winthrop up on a hill uh, for $2,000 and spent another $1,000 to renovate it to make it livable. Um, so we grew up in that house, uh, all went to high school in the same town um, and all survived. So we were very, very fortunate. But we always joke in the family that uh, in my family, we had one queen, one princess, and seven serfs. And the, the seven boys were the, were the workers in the family, and the sisters were the ones that could please my father by making brownies or cookies. But it was all good. It sounds like, it sounds almost idyllic uh, as a, at your early years. Um, but it, I'm sure there were some tough times too. There were difficulties of one sort or another that, like most families, you had to weather. There, definitely. And my my mother was um, had the ninth child was my youngest sister, Mary Jane, and uh, just before three or four months before she spent in the hospital because she, she had a tumor. And it turned out to be the size of a basketball and the doctors wanted to take the baby and she wouldn't allow that. And so she was spent probably the three months before the birth and three months after the birth, maybe four or five months mm -hmm. after the birth, um, in the hospital, in doctor's care. So it was a tough time. With not only my brothers and sisters and my father worked together, but uh, also my aunts and uncles stepped yes. forward to help out and take care of some of the younger ones. How many aunts and uncles did you have? Well, my my mother has uh, five brothers and sisters, and my father had five brothers and sisters. Okay. Um, it always seemed that within the family, they were the godfathers, also were the godmothers. So uh, outside of your mother and father, then could you identify some of the uh, the most formative adult influences in your early life? Oh, were, there, were there certain aunts and uncles that... Step forward? Yeah. Um, well, my Uncle Jimmy was my godfather, and he was a doctor, and he was wonderful. He was a great guy. He 
um, had started in the north end of Boston in a poor section, but also he kept a clinic when he normally closed his office and he moved out to Brighton to St. Elizabeth Hospital. He also kept his office open in the north end as a clinic every Wednesday afternoon and every Wednesday evening. So when we had to have a physical or something, it was always to go in to see Uncle Jimmy. Um, my grandmother uh, on the Winthrop side, on the Mython side, was only lived down the street, it was five or six houses down. We called um, my home, my home, and we called my grandmother's uh, place, the house. Okay. So we always went down to visit the house, and my grandmother was a very, very positive influence. So she died when I was nine years old. Uh, my grandfather worked with my father in the business, and. Uh, uh, was called Willie, Willie Mython, um, and he was, again, an influence. Um, on the Italian side, on the my father's side of the family, we really, did, I didn't know my grandfather, but my grandmother, Nana, was just a wonderful, wonderful lady, and she died in uh, 1963. Um, and she told me that she was worried about me, Meeting, meeting the uh, 1962, meeting the right girl, and so the last time I spoke to her, she told me, "Don't worry, you're going to meet the right girl." She was in her 90s then, and it's going to happen soon. And that March, I did. I met my wife Noreen. So um, she died in February, and I met Noreen in March. And here we are together 50 years later. Who had the greatest influence then on your career choice? Or how did it happen that you decided to pursue education as a career? Well, the story goes, it's more to the point of where I went to college. Um, my mother graduated from Salem State, which was about 30 minutes away from Winthrop, uh, in 1925. And she was encouraging me to go to school, and, uh, but it was my choice again. There was no money in the family. It wasn't a question of going to a private school. A lot of my friends had gone into Boston to Harvard and to Northeastern and Boston College and BU and Bentley and all these schools, but that really didn't seem to be a choice. And one of my good friends graduated a year before me and said he wanted to go to Salem and wanted to get on and take the test at Salem, and why don't I go with him? And that was May of my senior year of high school. Other than that, I was going to go in the service and uh, like a lot of kids my in my generation. So I said, okay, I'll go with this fellow, Frank Beal, and I'll take a ride. Mm -hmm. He had a beautiful little Plymouth con yellow convertible, and off we went. I took the test, and I passed. And next thing you know, we got letters of invitation to go. So I went to Salem, and my older sister Donna was already going there, and my mother had graduated. So the big influence was Definitely my mother, as far as being a teacher and uh, encouraging me, and not only encouraging me, but wanted me to go on the elementary level rather than uh, my interest at the time was going to be either science or social studies. Everything was wide open, mm -hmm. as I hope most kids it is wide open. Yeah. But my mother was there just to love and encourage me and say, do it and you'll find out what you want. And the nice little story is in my senior year of college, uh, my junior year of college, Salem State has a training school, which is right beside the college. And I was assigned, I don't know how, but to work in a seventh and eighth grade classroom. We had seventh grade in the morning and the eighth grade kids came downstairs in the afternoon. And I went home and told my mother that I had been assigned to Miss Small. Miss Small was a six foot tall, older woman that ran a really tough classroom, and uh, she was very, very organized. And my mother said, oh my goodness, whatever you do, don't tell her who I am. And so, of course, her name was Mython, and my name is Demento. So she said, don't tell her who you are. So I went through my training experience, and a wonderful, wonderful experience, and it's really, this lady pushed us and made us be the best we could. There were three student teachers assigned in the junior year to this training classroom for the first half of the year. And at the end of the semester, I received this tremendous grade 
uh, from this teacher that no one else had got a, in those days, I got a 4.3 of a maximum 4.5 and nobody got a score in the fours from this woman. So I was taken back and I figured I better go over and talk to her and thank her. And I did. And when I went over and said, I just want to thank you for this grade. Uh, she said, you earned it. And I said, listen, now that it's over, I want to let you know who my mother is. She said, I know who your mother is. I said, excuse me? She said, when you came into my classroom the first day and I saw those blue eyes, I knew I knew those blue eyes from somewhere. And so I went and checked the records. And sure enough, your mother was in my class all those years before, and she was a student teacher with her, with Miss Small. So it turned out to be a great experience, and I went home and told my mother, of course, and my mom called Miss Small and started a new relationship. Wonderful story. Wonderful. Do you remember your first paying job? My first paying job was probably when I was eight or nine years old, working uh, as a paper boy, delivered the Boston Traveler in the mm -hmm. local neighborhood. I can, I can still almost tell you the numbers of the houses, <laughs> but I started on, my route started on Perkins Street and ended on um, Harborview Avenue, or Terrace Avenue it really ended on, uh, went right over the hill, so it was pretty local. Um, but my best jobs, my paying jobs, I worked when I was in the seventh grade, I worked as a pin boy setting up pins for seven cents a string, which is down at the local yacht club. Um, and so I did that on uh, Monday. Monday nights was league night. Wednesday nights um, was open bowling. Uh, so I seven cents a string, and that was big money. Yeah. And uh, for league nights, I got 10 cents a string, which was really ideal. But that job helped me as far as, from then on, I worked at the Yard Club all the way through high school and college, uh, working as a custodian, or what they call a steward up there, yeah. uh, doing all the work, on, especially on Saturday and Sunday mornings. You, you struck me, from what you said earlier, as being interested in athletics. Uh, were you uh, in sports when you were in school? Um, sports are a little different. I, I played football in high school on mm -hmm. my uh, sophomore and junior year and half of my senior year and then times changed which was a, an experience that sort of hurt in the middle of my senior year when seven of us were let go from the football team. We, we had a, a losing year that year but um, I also played JV basketball um, and which it was a tremendous experience for me and um, again in my sophomore and junior year, when the time came for my senior year, I wasn't good enough to continue. Would that come under the heading of after school interests or were there other things that took your time? Or... Well, there were, in those, I'd say between work and uh, playing mm -hmm. basketball, uh, basketball became a love. Oh. And I'm 75 years old now and I still organize a group. Uh, and I play in a group right here in Iceland. And we've got about 50 men anywhere from 25 to me that are still playing basketball um, and that's been great i happened to go down to florida the last eight years and when i've been going down to florida my second year down there we found a group of men who are over 55 playing basketball and there's 50 men in that group again who are over 55 play very very good competitive basketball as we do here in iceland but 20 of those men are over the age of 70. So, and it's again, we're from all walks of life, whether it's in Islip or down in Bonita Springs, Florida. Um, it's a great competitive group and it's a social group. Guys show up with a pair of shots and a t-shirt. We bang heads for, for two hours and um, it's wonderful. Awesome. So it's an interage type thing. Um, and it's now with people from different, down in Florida especially, people from all over the country, from Seattle, yes. from Minnesota, from, from Maine, from yes. Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and we play basketball. Oh, great. As old as fellas, we stop once in a while and um, share a drink together and yeah. uh, 
share our our past. Great. But it's not about who you are or anything else. It's about playing ball and sharing good family memories. So wonderful, wonderful. As it is here in Iceland too, yes. with these guys that we are able to stop once in a while, and we have get-togethers and. Um, we're men that enjoy the passion of basketball. It, uh, from earliest school years up through college, did you have favorite subjects or least favorite subjects anyway? Well, I always um, loved to read, and that came from my mother. Um, and, you know, I, I love social studies. I, I, I like math, um, but I'd say my number one area that I that I liked the most uh, was literature and reading. Okay, and that's continued it's to today. The, you, you have uh, the best of both worlds because you're here on Long Island and you're in Florida for part of the year. Do you have a favorite season? Well. Growing up, I'd have to say my favorite season was the summertime because right down the street was a yacht club and I was out on the water all the time and I was independent and I was um, sailing as a crew and uh, many times with men that had served in the Second World War were very talented, able men that I didn't find out until years later mm -hmm. how important they were to me but men that had served across the Pacific and that sort of thing and yeah. done, a, done a great job. Um, uh, a far afield from what we've been talking about, I, I want to ask you a question about an aroma that when you have a whiff of it, it takes you right back <laughs> someplace. It's, it's two things. There's one is the, uh, the smell of the salt water. Uh, being a, Winthrop, the hometown that it is, there's a salt air in the town uh, that is very, very def yes. different and um, distinct. And I love the ocean. And we had the ocean on the one side of us, Winthrop being a peninsula and Boston Harbor on the other. So both, of, both areas were tremendous for me growing up, whether going out digging clams or digging worms for the most part, just for bait uh, was great. But there's one more smell that is very, very distinct. And it's going to, a lot of people will tell you they remember it and can smell it very clearly today. And that's coming out from underneath the stands at Fenway Park and smelling the, the, the green grass that just recently been cut. And it's, it's just a special place. And that green grass that's been recently cut gives you a distinct smell that nowhere else. How about taking us through for a walk through the schools that you've attended? The schools I've attended or the schools that I've worked in? Schools the I've schools you've attended. Uh, schools that I've attended. The, the first school, we didn't have kindergarten in those days and I didn't go to nursery school, but we had first grade. Um, it was Shirley Street Elementary School, which was about half a mile to the school and we had to cross a number of streets. Um, but it was a wonderful school. They had two classes on each grade level, grades one through six. And like I told you before, I remember the names of all of my teachers and I can, I can picture right now, I can look out the window in every one of those classrooms and, and tell you what I could see outside those, those rooms. Um, and so Shilda Street was very special. And then on to the Winthrop Middle School, which has now been torn down. Uh, and went to high school. Um, all good schools, all served the purpose, all had great friends. Um, and like I said, my opportunity to participate, I participated in student government and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And um, I was on the social committee in my junior and senior years in high school, which was like an executive committee, an organization committee, but we did a lot of things together. Uh, because of the Yacht Club being right down the street and my involvement with the Yacht Club, probably one of the key experiences for leadership that I had was to get involved with running dances. There was a dance hall on the, on the third deck of the club 
overlooking the water. The water, the club itself was sitting out. So on three sides, there was water around the club, and had this beautiful dance hall on the on the uh, the top deck. So whenever the club wasn't bu busy, and while I was in high school, I was able to put a little note out that would have a record hop, or I could hire a band and bring a band down and run it. And I did that to high school and college. So the opportunities down there were was special for me. And where was your, the, the, beside uh, the, the undergraduate work that you did, where did you complete your graduate work? When I came to Long Island, um, Mo, John, Mo Beaulieu, Johnny Galaris, and myself, we thought it was important. We knew we needed to get a master's degree, so we, we started to go to Hofstra. Oh. And um, we were able to complete, I, I think Mo and I both completed our degree in 1961. I think Johnny took a couple of more years. It was all taking courses uh, mm -hmm. part-time uh, while we were going to school. Um, what ever happened to Mo? Uh, Mo is, uh, became a, uh, what they call a general instructional supervisor in Brentwood for a couple of years. And then um, probably in the 1960s, he moved and went to Oceanside as an assistant, an assistant principal, and then up to uh, uh, Harborfields ah. as a principal. He was a principal of the middle school up in Harborfields for many years, and that's where he retired from. And of course, we know that John Galaris did the, the remainder of his time in, in Brentwood. And Johnny Galaris, um, my good friend in college, as Mo was, we played basketball and soccer and all those things together and just were in the same fraternity, which is really a social fraternity. Um, but Johnny Galaris was our wingman that if we ever had a no one name, Johnny Galaris was the one that would remember the girl's name or the, uh, who it was and anything about their family. So even when John was down here in, um, in New York working at Broward, uh, one of the principals, Chuck Puglio, called me about a reference that I'd put in for Johnny Galaris. And I said to Chuck, who was also my very good friend, I said, Chuck, you can't remember your wife's name my name or anybody else's name. And he said, John would be the perfect guy for you because John will not only remember every kid in the, in the school, but he'll remember their parents and their parents' names. And he'll be a tremendous addition to match you. And Chuck hired him and thanked me many times afterwards mm -hmm. for hiring a guy that not only was a good person, but also a uh, had a tremendous memory. Now your first year, in the Brentwood School District was 1957, 58. Why, besides the, the congruence of just a visit with some friends, there was no other reason, uh, coincidentally, that you happened to start in Brentwood. Is that right? Well, not really, except when we came to Brentwood, and we had a friend here already, but also because Gene Hoyt, made a tremendous impression on me when I met him. That one day, he was a bright man, a man that cared, um, seemed to be, even when I met him at the first times, he was a philosopher. And he encouraged uh, us and told us how good Brentwood would be for us. So, and it worked out, not only in Brentwood in those days, that the superintendent was not only a leader, but he turned out to be our friend. Um, he invited us to play golf with him, invited us to play cards with him. Uh, so John, Mo, and I in particular played, played cards with Lee Stewart, who was the assistant superintendent at the time, or they call him the assistant district principal. Yes. Gene Hoyt was the district principal. So it turned out to be a very, very positive relationship. And later on, um, after three years, Brentwood won a Ford Foundation grant, uh, and Gene Hoyt was the the push behind that, but, and a fellow by the name of Ronnie Janice, who was chairman of the math department of the high school. Ronnie had the ability to have tremendous contacts in the math world, and he needed uh, classrooms to demonstrate this. 
and he worked with me right from the beginning when I was up at North Elementary School, would come into my class and do demonstration lessons, and then he would insist that I would do the demonstration lessons in when he brought visitors in. And he brought the manipulatives, the Cuisinier rods. He also the brought the Cuisinier rods, which was one of the math programs one. that we used. Um, we were involved with the school mathematics study group, which was a group that started after Sputnik. The federal government popped a lot of money into it. But yes, I still believe in using the manipulatives and the concrete materials for kids. Uh, but I also believed in the concepts and the studies, things that went on on some of the other programs, school mathematics group, University of Illinois math program, um, Syracuse had a great math program, Maryland had a great math program, and we had those leaders, Bob Page and Max Biberman and these men, come to Brentwood and work with us also. And I remember a story about Ron Janice taking classes out to Brookhaven National Laboratory where they worked on the computer the only computer that the, that was in this area. And but, one of his students, one of his students, went on later, in years later on, to be a co-inventor of the Macintosh, Apple's Macintosh. Yeah, he was, he was known as the, um, the father of the Macintosh. What he did was, after my three years in the classroom, then Ronnie Janice asked me and Mo Bollier and Marianne Fournier and Helen Yeager and a few others to come to work with the math department and do demonstration classes in the, uh, in the schools, and we did. Um, and at the same time, Ronnie believed internally that we have to um, learn all the time, so every week we had study groups and he brought in special teachers and so on. And we visited uh, Stony Brook, which is just forming, and we fought, we visited uh, going out to um, Brookhaven National Lab. But it was, it was um, an opportunity that with Ronnie that we had to learn. And he wanted us to learn Fortran which was a very difficult yes. language, and yes. we did on Saturday mornings, and he brought experts in. Um, we learned a lot about the, how languages are written and what is the ability of a computer in those days. We didn't have a computer and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but we did have Ronnie who was had enough foresight to know that this was coming and to check yeah. with lots and lots well, of course, of the piece the Personal computer hadn't been developed hadn't been yet. developed at, at no. all. Um, you know, it's, I'm just drawing a blank right now, and how can I? But I uh, just forgot the name of the uh, young man, Jeff Raskin. Jeff, how, did, how, yeah. how could I forget? That's it. You know. I'll tell you a little story about Jeff Raskin. Yeah. yeah. Jeff Raskin was in one of the first classes going to Stony Brook University, and while he was in high school, he would come into the math office and he would ask us questions that he already knew the answers to. And, and he, he was a mature kid, um, but he would come in and just try to break chops. For the most part, we were able to give him his answers or direct them, but, um, and if I couldn't, and I couldn't answer some of the things, definitely, but Ronnie Janice could, or one of the others. Um, but he went off to Stony Brook. And while he was at Stony Brook, uh, he used to bring things in and. Uh, he brought one time a shoebox filled with punch cards, and he had this design on it, on the top, and it looked pretty nice. But I was, you know, busy at the time, and I said to him, ah, I've seen better, Jeffrey, you know, I've seen kids that can do more. Well, he sort of stormed out, and the next day he came back, or a couple of days later, and he had this, again, box that looked like a shoebox filled with key punch cards with this tremendously unique design on top. Did he go back? Now he said, what do you think of this? I said, that's pretty special. And I mean, that, and he was pretty special, but they told him at Stony Brook, if he broke in, he and his friend broke into the computer lab one more time, uh, that they would have him arrested. Well, they did. They broke in one more time and security picked him up and suppose they had him arrested and he was told not to do that anymore. And then Jeffrey disappeared. Jeffrey graduated and he went out to Chicago and then he went out to the, 
UCLA and he was working out there and uh, from what I heard two fellas came to him one fellow by the name of Jobs and the other guy um, by the name of Wojtasek came to him and said um, listen we have some software we have some hardware that but we're having trouble putting it together and we need some help and I wonder if you'd be able to work with us he did and the next step out was the Macintosh computer. And he's been given credit for that. Now, I hadn't seen Jeffrey for a while. Jeffrey is now deceased. Like yes, Jeffrey is now deceased. But the sad thing, well, the good thing was that I opened up a local paper and I saw a full page ad from Stony Brook University. And it says something along the line, come to Stony Brook because we can help you in the new technology technology world. And Jeffrey Raskin, who was our graduate, who they had arrested, is now father of the Macintosh computer. So yes. it was quite a yes. quite a jump. <laughs> and uh, the fellow by the name of Jerry Steiner, who was public relations in Brentwood at the time, I told him what happened and I saw this this picture and he said, We had a lot of budget problems in those days and he said, I wonder if Jeffrey would be able to help us. Now, his his father worked for the post office in Brentwood. Uh, and it was a friend of mine in the Lions Club, a uh, good man. And I called him and got his number. I got Jeffrey's number. and uh, We called. He said, I don't know if he'll be able to do whatnot. And anyways, we did call Jeffrey and I had a long conversation with, with Jeffrey and uh, how much he was able to give to Brentwood, I'm not quite sure, but um, it was it was interesting. Uh, I'm reminded that every time we drop and drag or grab and drag something, it was because of Jeffrey Raskin. I I'm not quite sure of that I know I have, Jeff, I have read you, that you I read that I read it. it may or may not be true, but I think of him every time. I I make that maneuver and think of how one of our kids has influenced the entire world. He told me at the time that um, money-wise of the experience, he was very involved with the um, symphony orchestra and he did a lot of the arrangements and he did a lot of, um, with the help of synthesizers and computers, did a lot of the arrangements out there and that's where he got his interest. This, and, a, this is a great aside and it's a great um, line of of memories that were going down. But I want to bring it back to you, Peter, okay, okay. if I can. Right. Um, how did you end your formal education? How, in other words, what degrees, or what certifications did you did you re, uh, settle for when you, all was said and done? Well, I got, I had my, my master's from Hofstra, and then I continued to take courses, of course, yeah. because, you know, you had to grow. And I took all my administrative credits and I became certified both as a, a principal and a superintendent. Um, but I continued to go back to school because of growth and need to know. And I, um, I had a summer sabbatical for a couple of years and I got a background in special education because I thought that was important also. But I, I must have ended up with probably you know, maybe an MS, 80 or 90, okay. lots and lots of credits afterwards. But it's all, be and a lot of my experience of my true courses, the courses that I got the most out of, were probably the courses that Ronnie Janice taught us uh, in the math department. Wow. Um, we got, I got a tremendous math background mm -hmm. in such that it gave me an opportunity to teach down at Hofstra. I taught at Hofstra for 13 years. Uh, taught graduate courses in, in teacher education, but in math and curriculum. Uh, and a lot of it goes back to what I learned with Ronnie Janice yeah. and Bob Page and these other fellows, Max well, Biebman. You know, when the Ford Foundation came to Brentwood, as you mentioned before, <coughs> uh, Ray Shealy was at one time involved with the Ford Foundation, but he also taught at Hofstra. Yeah, Ray Shealy and um, uh, a couple of other mm. uh, uh, people with involved but the key people the person <coughs> excuse me that was involved with the ford foundation was ronnie janice and he had the ability 
not only to talk to mathematicians, but he talked to uh, Jerome Bruner, who was up at Harvard, who was the, probably the key educational philosopher in the country at the time, and Gene Hoyt. So when they went up to, Hofst uh, to, uh, to Harvard to talk to him about it, it was really Ronnie that had the ability to communicate and what his dream was. Um, and he, through Jerome Bruno, made a, met a fellow by the name of Caleb Gattegno. And Gattegno was the fellow that was really the, the main push behind uh, uh, the Cuisinier materials. Hmm. That's, that's a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful story. Uh, you are fleshing out things that, uh, that I, I never even heard about. Well, once when the Ford Foundation was granted and because of the involvement of Jerome Bruner and Ronnie Janice, <coughs> excuse me, but um, Ford Foundation insisted upon in expanding it out of math. So he want, they wanted us to be involved with other areas, although the main influ influence was really the math. So Ronnie came back to Brentwood and was able to find talented people in Brentwood that could key the other areas. And uh, Ray Shealy is a philosopher in the background, but um, Ray Fornio was going to be the, the fellow in English, a fellow by the name of Vinnie Presno in social studies, in, um, in science, uh, Matt Melillo, and in, um, what did I forget? Um, in math, he had good, good people. He had people like uh, Norm Michaels and... Um, um, Jack Clifford, uh, Jerry Roberts, who was the chairman of the math department in the high school, uh, all got involved in, in the middle school level, Eddie Murphy. Um, but on the elementary level, where the main influence was, we had Mo Bollier and Helen Yeager and Mary Ann Fournier. Back in those years, the Brentwood School District was literally at the cutting edge of uh, educational reform across the country. Without question, we ran courses during the year. Um, I was asked to be a math consultant in East Islip. Uh, that's probably one of the happiest days of my life um, because I went down and interviewed the superintendent in East Islip, and I'm a really, at this time, a fifth year teacher, uh, and all of a sudden I'm being asked to be a consultant for the school district and to run math courses for their teachers, uh, which I did. And I was making about $5,000 at the time, and I came down, and this was going to be after school hours, the only hours I was going to work. It wouldn't interfere with Brentwood at all. And Ronnie Janice told me, when you go down, you tell him that you think it's going to be worth $1,500 to $2,000, and that I'd be paid. And I thought, wow, that'd be big money. Well, I get down and spoke to the superintendent, and we had a great interview. And when he finished, he said he asked me how much, and I told him. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, your second figure was 2000 He said, I want you to, I'm going to give you $2,500. He said, I don't want you second guessing in the middle of the year that this is more work than you thought. Well, I got the job. I got $2,500 when I'm only making $5,000. Uh, I swear I, I walked back or I ran back to Brentwood to tell Ronnie Janice how much money I was going to make. Uh, but it was a great experience, and from that, I also worked out of West Hampton Beach and a few other districts, Shelter Island and so on, as a math consultant, all going back to those experiences that I had in Brentwood that gave me the leg up and the background that I had with those math programs, including SMSG and uh, Syracuse. And, and then the, there was also somebody who was doing, I think, an internship in the guidance area of the high school at that time who was writing a book and did write a book using Brentwood as a model in the book, but there was also a movie that was, uh, that was uh, uh, produced and directed called The Challenge of Change back at the time we're talking about. Oh, too, yes. Uh, about the revolution in guidance. Yes, and uh, again, all this was triggering yes. because of the... The leadership, I put yeah. it to Gene Hoyt, yeah. who was just this marvelous, marvelous man, yeah. able to encourage a guy like Ronnie Janice, and then in, 
Jerry Smith, uh, who was chairman of the guidance department and had lots of energy and lots of ideas and was able to get things to grow. Um, but it happened in every one of the years. Yes, it did. Um, if you hadn't become an educator, was there a, an alternative a second choice of career that was in the back, on the back shelf that you were toying with? Well, I, my first thought was getting out of high school was probably go in the Navy, but my, also I had been approached to go to work for the telephone company and I thought maybe as a sales rep or something along that line and um, maybe that's what I wanted to do. But at the time I really didn't have an idea, but after that junior year with that teacher, Miss Small. Okay. Um, that did it. That did it. I knew that not only that I got the recognition, but that I loved being in the classroom. I loved preparing those lessons, and I loved being uh, with the kids and with challenging people. We, uh, we're about halfway through where we're going, and this is a delight and a real treat for me. I hope you don't mind the... By the way, okay. Uh, when you mentioned that the super, the uh, district principal Eugene Hoyt greatly impressed you when you came, do you remember any of the questions he asked? Or do you remember? Was there a formal interview besides just a give and take? And a, a, no, it was really a group interview. Yeah. And um, what I can tell you about Gene Hoyt, my. After uh, three years in the classroom and then three years with the math department, the district was um, reorganizing and instead of having math consultants, was going to have what they call general instructional supervisors. And a fellow by the name of Joe Dion was involved. And Joe Dion was going to do the interviews. And I took the interview and I was, thought I was very analytical about it and that sort of thing. And afterwards, Joe Dion told me um, I didn't get the job and there were like 12 people chosen from the ranks and here I've been working doing all this teaching and everything else I didn't get a job I was in shock so I asked for an exit interview with Joe Dion and he said well I, I can give you 10 minutes so I went into the office and told him straight out listen I don't know need to know why I didn't get the job that's your decision but the thing I need to know is where you think I should go from here, what I should do. And he said, well, uh, we started to talk. And after an hour and a half, he left the room and he came back and he said, uh, what do you think? Would you like to be assistant principal at South Junior High School? Joyce Turner was going on sabbatical for six months. And then principal over in Loretta Park for the next six months. Now, here's a guy that was one minute not sure where he was going to be in the, the following year. Lula Tito had offered me a position back on his staff as a teacher. Uh, but all of a sudden, now I'm going to be administrator. And I'll never forget when I became my, as a principal, uh, I called Gene Hoyt and asked him a couple of questions. And he said, well, he turned the questions around to me and he said, uh, you know, whoever said the teaching was easy and whoever said being a principal is going to be easy, can you do it? And I took me back and I said, sure I can, yes. And from then on, I used my network, which was fantastic. You have to learn who your resources are. And I checked with certain guys like uh, Lula Tito, number one, and Ralph Sakin, and um, Joe Cousin, and Joe Graff. They were all, this fellow Jim Taylor, they were all wonderful people. Uh, Art Brigger, um, John Mead, I, can, I guess I can almost name all the principals at the time, but the, every one of them had a strength. And I learned to use that strength, those, their strengths, and call up if I had a question. And um, I was able to, and Gene Hoyt became not only, uh, and I could always go to Gene Hoyt, never afraid to ask him a question, but I always knew that he was going to turn it back to me and made me think and make, uh, yes. it was part of his 
technique, his Rogerian ability, go back to the guidance department, the Socratic method of yes. also making yes. us yes. do it ourselves. Yes. So he taught, um, he taught as a ongoing thing as a principal and superintendent or district principal to us that you got to step forward. Pete, in the years that you uh, that you served, um, you saw many, many changes in the district, not the least of which was its phenomenal growth. Uh, how would you say it was different uh, by the end of your tenure than it was in the beginning? Oh, boy. Um, we were a small district. I guess there were only 200 teachers uh, in the in the district in 1958. We all met in the Ross Auditorium. It had just been open two years now, the building. And um, we we met and Gene Hoyt spoke and we knew each other. Um, yeah. We did a lot of things socially together. We always had a picnic at the end of the year. I knew all the people in the high school, the middle school, the elementary school. We were all one big faculty. Uh, I would imagine very young, too. And a very, very young faculty. Everyone is young. I mean, you figure, um, I was 22 when my group was 22. We were coming in and um, the the senior leadership for the most part, you know, Gene Hoyt was a little bit older and Lee Stewart had a lot of experience. It was a wonderful uh, guide for all of us. Um, but in general, I'd say that the average age had to be in the in the 20s. Yeah. Uh, and, and single too. And single and therefore there was a lot of social interaction between us. Um, we the BTA used to have a Christmas party every year that used to be held in the schools. And um, the Board of Education sponsored it and provided some liquid refreshment that was that was great. And that stopped after a few years. We never had, not that I, that I know of, we never had an incident because of having um, a drink in the schools. But right. it was the right thing to do sure. at the time. Sure. But Times were different then. Yes. And, but it was, the key thing was that we were together. Yes. So whether Roy Rapp and Bob Hoppy and um, Bill Lown and all those phys ed people, there were so many great people on, yes. all over the district, Bob Tagner and Stan Kellner, and we knew each other. Yes. And we had an opportunity to socialize together, to learn together, yes. and to, um, to be together. And in many ways, Tony Felicio used to describe Brentwood as the family, and, and it was. It definitely was. You know, when we started the, uh, the math group in the, in the 60s, um, I had two, got, two fellows in my, uh, one of my math classes that came and took the math class. One was a board member, and the, the other was uh, a leader in the Islip community. And one was Tony Felicio and the other was Cesar Trunzo. And they were coming in as both parents and as interested people in the community and took one of my math classes. Now we had people from, this is sort of jumping, but we had people from all over the country coming to Brentwood in, those, in the 60s. Yes. And we ran summer workshops. Uh, and so, and they would be week long workshops and it was excellent. Yes. Uh, and we'd, we'd fill South, South Middle School would be filled with, um, uh, with, with people having lunch together from all over the country. I don't think it's an exaggeration, Peter, to say that many school districts from the, the easternmost part of Long Island to the westernmost part would eventually come to Brentwood to ask how we resolved such and such an issue or overcame this challenge or that challenge. We were always seem to be the first to encounter some of these things. Well, you know, we also had an opportunity back in um, 1970. I was a principal. I started, to, we started to talk about that, but I went as an, uh, let me just jump back. Yeah. But in uh, 64, 65, 64, I was principal, assistant principal at South, and 65, principal, acting principal at Loretta Park, and then 65 to 70 at Southeast, and 70 to 74 at South Elementary, and then South Elementary was closed and eventually sold to Entenmann's Bakery. But um, 
in those early years at South Elementary in 71, um, we got involved with another math program called CAM, or Comprehensive Achievement Monitoring. And it was the first use of computers to monitor hmm. uh, student growth. And we went out to test kids, but we were to, out to uh, for an evaluation. But what we were trying to do was give teachers feedback on how well their kids were doing in the math class. And at the time, we gave seven, we a group of us, Lula Tito, uh, Chuck Puglio, myself, a fellow by the name of Ed Harris, Tony Spitznagel and um, who did I forget? Um, went up to uh, Ed, Ed Harris was the third one. Uh, went up to the University of Massachusetts, and with a fellow by the name of Dick Groth, Bill Groth, uh, at University of Massachusetts, we learned about this program, and we came back and organized it in Brentwood, and it worked out. We had target schools at that time in Brentwood. Six of the 14 elementary schools were designated as schools that had kids in high poverty and were kids who were not achieving as well as the rest of the community. The other eight schools were scoring higher. These six schools were scoring lower. So anyways, Lula Tito at Northwest and Chuck Puglio at Twin Pines and myself at, Pine, at, at uh, South Elementary that first year, we wrote up a program, we wrote up a series of tests. We got involved with Stony Brook to do the evaluate, uh, to actually do the computer control end of it. Um, so it was a real joint program. And after a year, the three schools that were in the lowest performing schools were now scoring as well as the top performing schools. So the second year, we brought three more elementary schools in. And after the second year, those six low-performing schools were now scoring higher than the other eight schools. So the third year, they asked me, can you bring in three more schools? And Art Brigger asked me as the assistant superintendent. And I said, sure, that we can bring in three more. And that was the plan. Well, we went to a principal's meeting and it was a, a battle about which three schools were going to come in. So rather than bringing in three more schools, we brought in eight more schools that third year. So all of the elementary schools, grades four, five, six at the time, were involved with the CAM math program. And it really changed the way we taught math and monitored math. And uh, I like to believe that it's made a difference. Now that program started in 19... 71, the first summer, and here it is, the year 2012, and we're still using the CAM math program in Brentwood. And if I said, I'd like to believe a lot of things, legacy-wise, that a whole group of us were involved in, um, starting with Ronnie Janice, of course, but and, and Gene Hoyt, but that's still continuing today because yes, we still have right. that CAM math program. Yes. And we use the set of behavioral objectives and test items that back in the 90s, I requested the state bank of objectives um, and test items. And they sent them down a big bundle of items that the state had in this big bank. And what did I find? That 90%, 95% of the items in the state bank were the Brentwood items. So it's still today uh, a program that's making a difference for Brentwood kids. I want to ask you a question that you may or may not have information about, but because you were at South at the time that the district decided to close the building, part of the history of that era that I have uh, come to believe is that the district had uh, a, a ballooning population at the high school, and that was a problem. There, there was on triple session, overlap sessions. Yes. They, and so they put out a proposal uh, from Central to come up with uh, designs for alternative schools, and there was a competition, and there were 11 proposals, and eventually one was chosen that had signed up kids and had parents' approval, etc. And South was 
um, closed or that the, part, the, the students from South and the staff was moved elsewhere in the district. Part of the reason in the background that I heard, not alone solving the population issue or problem, but that since Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court decision back in 54, Brentwood was found to be not in compliance yet and because of the neighborhood or the community around South, that it was predominantly uh, African-American, the decision was made, well, we can solve two problems. We can provide an annex to the high school and relieve the pressure at the high school. And at the same time, we can get out from under this umbrella, that uh, uh, this dark cloud that we have been. Definitely. Is that true? Definitely true. Okay. And um, the school is located behind End of His Bakery. It was really an industrial area. It was not a good spot for an elementary school. I see. And we had the best neighbors in the world. Entman's was wonderful. Uh, we, we knew the, the leaders, in particular Charlie Entman, who was the operations mem uh, member of the family, the three brothers. And uh, he'd come over to the school and talk to me and how's everything going and uh, we being a good neighbor and that sort of thing. And he actually came over to me and uh, one time in an afternoon and said, um, listen, I know you've got control of this, but he asked me if, uh, what we need, we have some very big trucks and I need 50 more feet of land so I can, the trucks can churn to be able to go into these garages where they can load up um, materials. And I laughed and I said, well, the, the fellow you want to talk to is Guy DiPietro, who was the superintendent at the time. And I said, you got to go talk to Guy. And so I made an appointment for him. And he went over and next thing you know, uh, Entermans, never mind buying 50 feet or 100 feet of land, ended up buying the whole property. Yes. And it went into negotiations from that time, but once the alternate high school, Maslatov, yes, went, uh, went over there, um, it was just a matter of time yeah. before Entermans sure. did take, take possession over. of the... Of but the, the school was out of balance. There was out of ethnic okay. balance. There was okay. no question. And in 1978, uh, we had a committee that reorganized the attendance zones for the elementary schools. And as much as we wanted to keep it neighborhood schools, it just couldn't work. Yeah. So yeah. there were a couple of areas that had to travel. Okay. And yes. on the middle school in particular, um, had to get uh, areas that mm. would, we tried mm. to make them continuous. Mm -hmm. so that it was a natural flow for the kids and so on. But part of Regis Park had to go all the way over to East and That's that sort true. of thing. So and no one objected. I think people realized at the time that yeah. we're trying to do the right thing and the district did provide busing and we did provide uh, meetings where there was a lot of give and take back and forth. Um, we had good contact even in, in the early 70s uh, Part good, of the good uh, community relations. Part of the thing was like I had coffee clutches. Mm. Uh, I went into the neighborhood homes, so that yeah. rather than waiting for the parents to come to school, many couldn't or wouldn't. Um, mm. We'd get eight to ten parents sitting around a cup of coffee and talk. And I made tremendous uh, contacts in those yeah. years, and I still have some of those people that I can remember back in the early seventies that are still. How great that Friends is. today, Business. context. Awesome. Uh, forgetting for a moment the designation of, of, or the role that you played, teacher, administrator, there's a job description that comes with each of the four. How did you define your purpose for getting up every morning and going to work? I, I, I'm one of those lucky people that never had to go to work. I. I, and really, I say it without reservation. Um, I always had to go to school. Yes. And um, I had to go to school because it was the right thing to do and I wanted to be there. Um, there were challenges oh, over yeah. the years. There's oh, absolutely, sure. without question, there were days that um, I regretted. I, I, I had reservations about what I was going to meet up with that day. But. 99% of the time, uh, I wanted to go, and 
I was willing to go and I wanted to go. Yeah. So, no, Brentwood, um, and that came not only from the kids and the teachers who wanted to be there, but it came from the support of the administration on top and the school board, uh, especially people like um, Tony Felicio and Jim Lynch, who were just unique leaders. Jim came along, Jim Lynch came along at right when we were trying to decide what we should do with the high school. And I was involved with, with BIPSO as a Brentwood Principals and Supervisors Organization as, as, a, as a leader. And um, it, it was just a right bringing the right people together at the right time. So we, we always felt at that time, and I can tell you that we were backed. That yes. I always knew yes. the superintendent had my back if something came up. I always knew the other principals had my back, that it was someone to go to. And I always knew that the school board didn't interfere, but was back there and they knew who you were and they were behind you also. Yeah. So, and, and uh, I. What, what was your role with BIPSO when you were involved with, with them? Well, I was originally involved. Um, when we had the Brentwood Principals Association, it was just just principals. And then we, when the Taylor Law was passed, um, that we formed the Brentwood Principals and Supervisors Organization. And it was basically only principals and assistant principals and coordinators involved. And then eventually it, it, we involved um, department heads mm. and operational supervisors, mm. um, which all worked out great, fine. Um, but I was, Lula Tito was the first president of the organization. Oh. And um, we had 14 elementary principals. And so by numbers, I guess we, we had the vote, but it wasn't that way. Lou was uh, such a positive leader. And I worked with Lou as the chairman of uh, uh, labor negotiations, I think the committee was called, labor and negotiations. Um, and then I was president of the organization from 71 to 72. In some of our growth years, when we were looking at what to do with the high school and so on. Um, but I stayed involved afterwards for a number of years too. Um, I, get, I convinced Lou Latito, he had a heart attack and a year later, I convinced him to come back after I finished uh, to be the leader again. Um, so we went through some very trying years. Um, and had some traumatic events occur, not the least of which was the unexpected demise of the superintendent when Guy died. When Guy died, it, 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 there's no question, it, it shocked and disappointed us. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a whole question of uh, a man that was a very strong leader and very positive and very supportive. And, um, he was very honest about his emotions where one minute um, if someone did something that he didn't that didn't live up to his trust, um, he would speak out. So you had to be careful with guy. But at the same time, um, when Guy was becoming, there was a fellow by the name of Art Brigger, who was assistant superintendent, and and Guy would, and Frank Morrow, the three of them were chosen to serve on a committee to reorganize the budget when Lula Nini was superintendent. And they were asked to do it, and they got together and did it. And I thought Art Brigger had the experience as an educator and worked on the elementary level in particular. and. Um, Guy thought that I was supporting, pushing for Art Brigger to be superintendent. I thought he was going to be superintendent, but then Guy was chosen as superintendent. So when Guy first talk, took over, he called me and he said, listen, I know you were supporting, but I expect you to back my play. And I said, absolutely, without question. And it turned out that I, you, uh, Guy and I, we're on the same wavelength. And when we started to go with technology in the 1980s, guy called me one day 
Uh, I had got an experimental computer program, the first um, mini computer to be placed in a school. We had used, um, what's the name, so Commodore computers, 4K yes. Commodores in the schools. We had a couple of them, and I was chairman of the math committee at the time. And we had a couple of those in the school, and we were bouncing back and forth and learning. But we got this whole data bank that was brought in, and it was able to drive 30 computers in a computer lab that we set up. And guy thought it was too expensive, and it couldn't be duplicated in all the schools. And he was right. Um, but he, so he said after a year that we, after two years, we couldn't keep it. Well, then the next thing you know, and I was disappointed, he calls me up one day and he said, listen, we're going to put a bond issue up. Um, how much do you think we need for a computer lab for each of the elementary schools, middle schools and high school? And I'm sitting at my desk and I'm, he said, I need the figures now. He said, oh, I'll try to get them together. He said, well, no, no, just give me a rough figure. And I said, wait a minute, I, I, I don't know if I can do that. But he said, give it to me. So I said, $30,000 for each of the schools, for the elementary schools, 60000 for each of the uh, the middle schools, and about 120000 for the high school. Okay. And I still have those notes somewhere it's in my file somewhere. Um, and that became the basis of a program that we started. And then when we try to talk between the levels of how we should implement technology into the schools, I started in my own school first, and we, uh, at the time, uh, put together a package. Um, and it, this was at Twin Pines, and we set up computer labs. And we did it in the elementary first, and the third year we did the middle schools. And by that time, we had had a lot of meetings in the high school, and it was a question, should we go with the computer labs or departmental labs? What should it be? Should they should the teachers be responsible for them or should they be in with key teachers being responsible? And the decision came from the high school, good friends, uh, Tom O'Brien and these guys wanted technology labs in each department uh, while the vote of the high school was really to set up labs. And that's what we did and yes. we, we set up, and Tony DeMarco being yes. the chairman of the, uh, the lab at the high school. Right. I'm sure we just got off the topic there, but that's okay. Listen, you're an easygoing guy, but there are, had to be things that really got under your skin, made you angry on a job. What would make you angry? What would it take to make you angry, Peter? I used to tell teachers, whatever you do, at the end of the day, uh, I'm going to be here on time in the morning, and I'm going to stay in the afternoon. But whatever you do, I used to say right away. Do not get run over by a bus, meaning that you're coming in at the last minute and you were leaving at the first minute. Um, when I had some people that would run out of the building at the end of the day, and they might have had problems, and I'm sure they did, but it was, I'm sorry, I just couldn't put up with that. And it happened one time down at Southeast that a bus driver came into the front office and was yelling at my wonderful secretary, Jane Lemoyne, about this teacher that she had almost run over for the second or third time. So, yeah, I would think that sort of thing made me. Yeah. But I didn't accept, expect everyone to have the same passion. That's the only way to describe it, that I had or have and still have. Mm -hmm. um, but I did expect them to want to be here in Broward. And I used to tell people when I'm doing an interview, hey, listen, you, you fit the bill for all these positive things, but I want you to know about Broward, and that Broward is not going to be an easy place. Yeah. And when the going gets tough, I need people to step, step forward, and I need people that want to be here, not because of a job, making some dollars and that sort of thing, but want to be here working with me and these Brentwood kids. So we might choose you, but I want you to choose Brentwood and me. So, and generally it worked. 
there were some disappointments, but sure. um, and I tried to be fair and honest with people and telegraph my moves and let people know that they had to grow or something, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, seek help, seek out help. What was the date of your retirement? Um, well, July 1, 1996, okay. and I had worked 38 years in Brentwood. And why did you decide, or why did you decide it was time to go? Well, I was 60 years old. Um, I, I had a brother, my brother Jim was just two years older than, uh, than I was at the time, who had cancer. and. Um, he died. He died that April, and I thought, well, if it can happen to Jim, it could happen to me. Yes. And I had an obligation also, not only to um, myself and Noreen, but also to my family to be available. So I decided, okay. And the district was offering, and the state was offering an incentive, okay. and I took it. Sure. And did I go on time? I probably should have worked in hindsight. You think so? A couple more years. What What didn't you get done that you wanted to get done? Oh, no, a million things. Really? That, that I, I still had. Um, you know, I I worked from uh, 74 to 92 at Twin Pines and 92 to 96 down at Southwest. And there were so many good things happening with the library, with the opportunities to, to make, it, make a difference. That What would you like to have done that you couldn't get to? Or that you didn't get done? One is I really would have liked to have been able to take that school library and make it. We had a two-room library in the elementary school and make it part of the community. Uh, yes. I really would have liked to have opened it up. We did a pretty good job of doing that and making it a great library and getting a lot of parent involvement and mm -hmm. read aloud books, which I'm very big in. Some people will tell you that it's Maybe I get too carried away, but I, every time I'd get upset in school, all I'd do is uh, I'd pick up a handful of picture books, or story books that I had in, in the office, and I'd walk down the hall and look for a classroom that I could go in and read to. And it wasn't just reading. It was talking about books and authors and illustrators. Right. So I'd do a lot of that. And yeah, I would have made like to have done that okay. and been more. And the other thing I finished up with is... Um, I planted a lot of trees in every school I was in uh, from the beginning. Um, one tree at, at North and one tree at, at uh, Northwest, but many, many trees down at South, uh, Southeast and, and South Elementary. And at Southwest, oh, we, Southwest, uh, when I was transferred to Southwest in 92, PTA president at Twin Pines took a ride by the school to see what it was like. And she came back and told me that she started to cry because it was, it looked like a blank building. So one of the things that I, when I left the school, uh, the faculty and a couple of teachers gave me some trees. Uh, these are 10 foot trees that I immediately went down um, and planted at Southwest. And we planted shrubs and trees all over the place. That, and the nice thing when I left, um, the faculty uh, dedicated the main, by the main part of the building, the garden there in my name. Oh, nice. So nice. I've, it's ironic that you mentioned that this is the 50th anniversary for a couple of the elementary schools. I think Twin Pines is one of them. 65, no, it's well, open in 65, so. Okay, well then I'm wrong on the school, but there are a number of, this be the year for 50th anniversaries, and Rob's is talking about providing trees to each of those when they come on their 50th. Nice. That they will do the same thing that you've done. We, one of the things that I did um, when I went down to Southwest is I, um, Jerry Steiner got me to meet this lady and I just forgot her name. A uh, wonderful woman came down and did a whole plan of the school and the school grounds and wow. met with me and a couple of people in regard to what we think would be appropriate on the school grounds. And we have this huge master plan of the school grounds and what trees should be planted. And I, I sent out a note 
and I got a lot of people um, that donated trees. I had asked is, all is the Southwest at talking? Southwest. Yeah. I had asked either the individual or the family of each of the principals to donate a tree in the front. So the five trees in the front. And I can tell you right now who the, like the five principals were Charlie Walters, Art Brigger, Frank Hall, John Mead, Austin Honey, and myself. Mm -hmm. So at that time, there was a, a continuation with the trees that we had right there. Yeah. I asked the assistant principals to do the same thing in front of the annex, and I contacted those families. and. People were generous. We asked about, I think it was $125 um, to donate that. And the tree only cost me $100, but $25, I was able to get yes. more shrubs too. Uh, but everyone understood. And it was, it still today serves to Wonderful. me as a continual one. Sure. What was the most fun that you've had of all the assignments that you've, that you've done? Is there one thing that you could say, I, that was... That was incredible. I enjoyed that. Well, probably the most fun. I always had a question about what is fun and what is what is joy. Okay. Uh, and I always was not sure that school should be uh, fun as much as there should be joy yes. and enjoyment from oh, internally. Yes. Oh yes. And I'd say. All of, all of my schools and so on were, were great, but Ronnie Janice started me on the program on the math. And I've been chairman of the math committee um, all the years that I was in Brentwood from Ralph Sakin when I became a principal was, uh, was the chairman of the math committee of the elementary schools. And I got on the math committee then in 1965. So from 66 on, I was either chairman of the elementary committee or chairman of the district math committee. And uh, because of the CAM program and um, the use of technology and the development of technology, I'd say being chairman of uh, the math committee probably was a tremendous success. Um, and it turned out chairman of the math technology committee. What do you miss? I miss uh, the kids, and I miss the teachers, and I miss the camaraderie of um, everyone, including all the administrators. Um, I miss the uh, opportunity to stay abreast of what's happening. Um, and what don't you miss? Um, the internal politics. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, I... I had good people that I worked with, so um, we were, were overcome, able to overcome most of the internal politics and get good things done. Given the state of public education uh, across the country, uh, not just locally here or regionally on Long Island, could if you had a magic wand, Lou, and you could wave it and make three things happen maybe one of the things might be made to make something go away that you'd like to get rid of but what do we need to do to improve on the quality and the process of education in this country number one i just think we have to do more with the parents we have to share more with the parents and get the parents involved i'm a i'm a great believer that um the parents are the key ones to make a difference on a, a child's education. Um, and I think the leadership of the schools can do it. Uh, so I, I'd say involving the parents in every learning opportunity. Um, and if I had to chase, if I had to reorganize something, um, I think the financial, the way the schools are, uh, are funded through the state, it's not the school's responsibility or the local communities responsibility to educate the kids, it's the state's responsibility. So I think the burden should be shifted to the state, the ability to collect taxes and to distribute those properly. Uh, and a community like, uh, like Brentwood uh, that does not have the economic background of the families uh, gets, gets shot changed all the time. And when we have, uh, without naming some of our very neighboring bordering school districts, 
that have so much more wealth because they're tax base and they're able to do so much more with their kids. And to me, it's definitely much more expensive to educate um, a disadvantaged child than a child who has his parents involved and his two family, uh, two parent families, where we don't have that luxury in Brooklyn. That's true. And you have kids who are there for part of the year and not all of the year and are the mobility of the mobility, I don't know what it is now. You know, uh, this is my six, 16th year out, but the mobility rate was just, uh, up in the 50 percentiles. And so people don't understand that what it does for a teacher who tries to teach a math class at a secondary level. We, they've covered these skills in the beginning. And the end of the year, half of the kids in the class are going to be different kids and they're going to be filled with different kids in those chairs and they might have been there in September they left in December and came back in February so and it's so hard for the teachers to to get continuity and to make it happen and by the way <laughs> our teachers do it our teachers yeah. I don't care if it's a kindergarten level, uh, and I've worked as a sub in the high school and see what the teachers are doing with the scenes. Uh, everyone's trying to make a difference and does make a difference. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, that was a question that I was going to, not a question, but a, I'm going to ask you to complete the statement, and I think you probably have just said it in so many words. Um, complete the phrase, Brentwood's teachers are without question, the best. And I've had experiences of going into classrooms in many other districts from, without naming Nassau districts again, all the way to the end of the island. Um, Brentwood teachers work under restrictions yeah. that many other places don't have. And it's not just class size, it's, it's materials, it's contact with the home. Um, it's yes. opportunities to share with each other. Uh, yes. I'd love to have yeah. people get upset with me, but I, one of the firm believers that there should be common planning time and the yes. teachers should be working in, in teams and not in just isolated classrooms. And yeah. the, the, I think you, you learn more from your peers than you do from someone that's telling you what they think should happen. Oh boy, if only we could use that magic wand. That's exactly what uh, we're talking about. And, he, and here, again, the other side of that, because of the uniqueness, I believe the uniqueness of the community, uh, Brentwood students are. Uh, Brentwood students, again, um, have, have risen, the kids in the school have made a difference in spite of many of the kids having problems at home. They come to school with a positive attitude. I, I've met up with kids that many people would consider tough kids and difficult kids and are those same kids you can find common ground with and who want to make a difference themselves. You probably answered this question before uh, and therefore I don't want to I don't want to push, but did you have a favorite year or is there an outstanding memory that pops up when you think of one of the best experiences that your career gave you? You don't have to answer that. That's not intended to... There's so me. many positive things. Um, I know I can't... necessarily say that I my experiences with the the math department and becoming a principal uh, were also positive and what was your first assignment as an administrator my first I was acting assistant principal at South and do you remember how much you made that year yes um, I made um, I was scheduled to make, as a classroom teacher, $9,400. Okay. Um, and my contract came through with $9,000. And so I went to Gene Hoyt and I said to him, what's going on? You know, I'm going to be working the extra month and everything else. And 
He said, do you want the job or not? And this is my friend. This is a man that I chose as a, uh, as a mentor, one of my mentors. And yeah, I want the job. So I worked that summer. We must have taken maybe two weeks from July 1 uh, until school opened to go camping with the family. But the rest of the time I was in with Mike DeBellis and George Pittman over at South. So, um, and he was right. It, it's not a question about how much I made, um, but it was, um, do you want to do the job? Is this what you want? And it, it came down to the end. It was a great surprise um, that I was making good money. Yeah. And it was also uh, wonderful to find out. And I hadn't even checked about retirement until that last year, that how much money I was going to get in retirement because I didn't realize you'd put sick pay and bonus money and have to figure out a different average. You know, I, I knew that, uh, but I didn't put it to, to use to say how it was going to affect me. We have been all over the place, Peter. We've talked about many, many different things. Um, and I don't want to leave without asking you if there's something that you had in your mind to talk about or there's something that you wanted to say that uh, we haven't gotten to yet. So let it be an open-ended um, thing. Anything that we I didn't know to ask you or you wanted to make sure we got in. I, there's, there are certain people that were just so unique that I, I could never forget them. And um, that were tremendous influence on me as a, a, a teacher and a, um, a colleague in Brentwood. And um, I mentioned a few of them already, but people like um, Ralph Sakin and Lula Tito and um, Mike DeBellis, they were just great people and made a difference for me. But I could never forget, and I mentioned uh, Gene Hoyt and Lee Stewart. And Lee Stewart was the father figure for us um, and great, great great man. I can't forget guys like Hank Salerno, um, who was climbing trees, and Bernie Honky brought him in for an interview. And because uh, he, Bernie Honky thought he was a bright guy, and he brought him in and turned out to be not only a great teacher, but a great administrator and a great friend. Um, Joan Lang came down from Massachusetts. I didn't know her when she came down. I didn't meet her till years afterwards. Um, that turned out to be, you know, a great colleague. Elsie Rebus um, worked with me and Tony Spitznagel. Um, we just had so many good teachers and good friends uh, that worked together. Um, Julio Rodriguez, people forget about Julio, was one of the first organizers of the BTA and uh, try to get the union in, in Brentwood uh, back in the early 60s. Um, so Lots. Joe Dion made it made a difference. Uh, Art Brigger, uh, a tremendous leader. Um, Joe Dion, who became the first CEO of uh, of the publishing house uh, that was not family. Yep, he was the uh, CEO of McGraw Hill, um, and who had lunch every day in five different dining rooms uh, because different sales reps would bring in different people. And he would bounce from table to table. Joe was a very, very bright, able guy. Um, but also before him was Art Brigger, who was always trying to do the right thing for Brentwood. And yes. had Brentwood yes. um, always trying to make something good happen. He was a very, very good administrator and a very, very good uh, educational leader. Peter, I don't know how to say thank you other than to say thank you so much for giving of your time and this incredible history lesson that you've given us today. Well, thank you so much for being with us. You're very welcome. Glad to share.